One of my favorite sayings is that this game is not about the magic. It's about the gathering. For many of us, it is the people we play with that define the best qualities of this game. And within that community, many Magic the Gathering players who might turn around and ask, just who are the humans of Magic that we share this game with? Immediately, I love blue. I thought, you know, blue is my favorite color. It was also clearly the best color. And so I, you know, I like to play counterspell decks, um, decks that were, if not creatureless, very close to creatureless. Uh, I don't know if we used the term control decks or not back then, uh, but that's definitely what they were. It, because I tend to be the legacy player in the team trios, uh, teams that I play on, I am quote unquote lucky enough to play maybe one legacy tournament a month to every six weeks. So with that even as immersed as i am in magic that's how much i get to play the format so how how invested can the average player be look i i actually do like magic online i played a lot of magic online it's what got me started as a competitive player a professional player uh i still play it i played some today you know but it's a way to play vintage online now which is awesome but I don't think that uh, Magic Online is what you would use if you wanted to expose new people to Magic, and in fact, it has consistently not done a good job of that, just because it just looks like a video game from the 90s, right? It's, it doesn't look like a, a modern video game. It's still stuck there, yes. At times, it, like being a professional Magic player is not all that rewarding because you're just like grinding Grand Prix and stuff, and uh, part of it, which I don't think was like explicitly mentioned in the article, but one of the things that I always found kind of strange was just like how quickly you're forgotten. It's like, you can win a tournament in one week and then like the next weekend, like there's already another tournament, someone else won and they just forget you. That is the question the book, Humans of Magic, seeks to answer as it explores and reflects upon interviews with the game's greatest minds. Taken from select episodes of the podcast of the same name, Humans of Magic is a collage of the faces of the Magic the Gathering community, diving into their relationship with the game, their struggles, successes, and failures. Among those featured in the book are John Finkel, Jerry Thompson, Noah Walker, Emma Handy, Paulo Vitor, Brian Gottlieb, Luis Scott Vargas, and so many, many more. Host James Sue guides these conversations from the professional to the personal, offering us as audience a more intimate look at the lives of those featured. So the first question that many may be asking is, why not just listen to the podcast? Well. You can. It's a fantastic podcast, and I'll include links to it in this video's description. But I'd like to explore the ways in which this book is not just a transcript of the show. There's a lot more going on here. First of all, the book is an edited and refined selection from the podcast. That means that James has taken care in crafting not only an interwoven narrative of Magic the Gathering lifestyles and mentality, but also just edited the conversational interviews into a more digestible and fluid work. In other words, the many ums and uhs and buts and you knows that often dominate interviews such as these have thankfully been edited out, making for a clear and concise read that is direct and engaging. Yeah, I mean, if, if you asked, you know, top 100 Magic players in the world, you know, 75 of them would say that they prefer limited. But the reality is, of course, is the Limited coverage doesn't sell as many cards. Uh, you know, Wizards has, you know, again, going back to them, they call it the New World Order. Um, you know, they've really um, tried to uh, optimize Magic in a way, uh, you know, to sell as many cards as possible, um, which is often related to having the the best game, but not um, but not always. And this is part of, you know, again, when they want to make sort of the, the big threats better, you know, they would never want a card like Counterspell for two blue mana, which I'm not even saying it would be good if it existed or not. Um, you know, they want all the big dragons and things to be good. This is like with Planeswalkers, which I think was just an enormous design mistake. I think that they've made Magic into a much worse game. And uh, and also when they really made a concerted effort to 
move the cards that were going to be, uh, you know, constructed playable, you know, into the rare and the mythic slots. I think this is around when they came with, with, with the mythic as well. Um, so that in order to really, to, you know, to feel the competitive deck, um, he, you know, required the purchase of a lot more cards uh, because a much higher percentage of the cards, um, you know, would be mythic or rare as opposed to common and uncommon. Also, one of the advantages to having this in book form versus the audio podcast is that many of these interviews, especially the earlier ones from the start of the podcast's run, had audio that may have been less than exemplary. Being able to sit and read the words of these faces of the community versus struggling to hear a tinny voice over a static-filled phone call allows us as audience to focus more on the merit and intent of those words than simply struggling to hear them at all. I think that the biggest thing magic can teach you uh, is how to lose, is is how to deal with things not going your way. And it can be hard. I mean, trust me, I, I did not feel good when I got knocked out of the Invitational last week, you know, when when it was like, I, I went 0-2. <laughs> it's the worst record you could have. Uh, but I, I think that magic really does teach you, because uh, it, it, it's like a two-pronged thing. It's like, how do you deal when something bad happens to you and how do you learn from it and what can you do differently? And it's really important to to to, to realize when you can and can't. I mean, you know, you know the, the old saying, it's like, what is it? Um, grant me the, the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the ones I can, and the wisdom to tell the difference. Like every, people say that. Obviously, it's an important concept. But magic really drills it into you. Like I've lost more games of magic than almost anyone, right? I've played so much magic. And – it makes it so when I get like a flat tire, I don't I don't get tilted. I don't, I don't get really mad. Like, yeah, I'm not happy about it, but I know that it's just going to happen. You're going to run over a nail sometimes. You know, sometimes you're 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 going to be late or your flight's going to get canceled. Sometimes, you know, you're going to drop your ice cream. Like, all, all of these things happen. And what magic does is it just pounds that into you because most people don't have to f- confront losing quite so many times quite as often you know as much as when you play magic and you care when you lose at magic i mean i still care and i think it's really valuable because a lot people don't it's you don't you're not born learning how to deal with frustration you know and get having magic really help give you tools to deal with that both in terms of accepting when yeah a bad thing happened you know what's next and also you know what am i how am i going to learn from this what can i do to prevent this in the future the, the second part of that being, I made the right decision. A bad thing happened anyway. I'm going to make the same decision next time, not being results-oriented. But the book is more than just a clean copy of the podcast. James has prefaced each interview with additional thoughts on the people who he has reached out to. There is an additional introduction and closing words, as well as a forward by Autumn Burchett, examining the shifting role of members of the community in Magic the Gathering. And I personally just love the design of the book, with the stylistic caricatures of the various humans of Magic themselves, adding to the overall feel of seriousness and maturity and depth present in not just this work, but the magic community itself. You know, we all grew up with magic being thought of as a kid's game, and usually books were slapped together with no mind or care for the game or the people who played it. I appreciate the respect that Humans of Magic treats its subjects with, treats the magic community with, and that is appreciation and respect, exploring it as an actual lifestyle and not just some frivolous kids game, and not shying away from conversations of deeper weight or import. Please note, this next excerpt is from Emma Handy's powerful interview in which she discusses how her struggles with gender dysphoria at one point led to a suicide attempt. If you wish to skip this section, you may go to the time code indicated on the screen now. And a lot of the things I did in life kind of lined up with people who suffered from gender dysphoria, and I was afraid people would find out. And it was something I'd worked to keep under wraps for a very long time. The Southeast is not very kind to trans people. I thought if people found out, my life as I knew it would be over. All this work I had put into making this identity of who I used to be would just be for nothing. 
and I started having a lot of panic attacks just in public and at home, anywhere imaginable. And they, they got pretty bad. Um, sorry for the, the pauses, it's starting to get a little heavier. Um, after, after everything wrapped up Saturday, I end up taking a gun home and deciding that I am done and I'm going to try to kill myself. Um, I think that is an easier out than trying to be openly trans. I don't want to deal with things anymore. It didn't feel like I had anybody I could be honest with or talk to about it. And without any kind of solutions, I kind of just figured the way I was living wasn't a way to live, but the other way wasn't a way to live either. And, um, I failed at, um, I, I failed at killing myself. <laughs> at the end of the day, I think Humans of Magic is a great work to have on the shelf. It is a testament, not just to the game, but the people who we play it alongside, the lives they have touched, and the ways that, yes, even ourselves in the audience may have touched back. Humans of Magic is an ongoing podcast, and I encourage viewers to check it out. And if you are looking for either a great magic book to read or perhaps give as a gift, then this would be high on my list of recommendations. Final conclusion. Humans of Magic is an adult exploration of the people who play Magic the Gathering at its highest levels, both new and old. It offers so much more than just a brief overview discussion about how each person got started in Magic, but instead dives into the struggles, highs and lows of their lives, and how they mentally cope with these issues. While the book is derived from the podcast, the interviews have been wonderfully curated and edited so as to translate to the page. Along with stylistic illustrations and additional notes, the book isn't just bringing the podcast to the page, it is bringing and highlighting the best of it. For the Magic the Gathering player who is a part of this community, who loves not just the cards, but the world of magic, the, a the gathering itself, this is a great pickup, and the grade is a solid, enthusiastic A. I hope very much this video has been of some help to you. Links to the Humans of Magic podcast and to purchase the book are available in this video's description. Looking for other reading materials this holiday season? Be sure to check out my other reviews of Magic the Gathering literature, both fiction and nonfiction. So be sure to give that a view. And this program was made possible thanks to a sponsorship from Card Kingdom, as well as the Patreon support of viewers such as you. So thank you.